Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, who keeps truth forever and never forsakes the works of his own hands. Grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Dear congregation, we worship the Lord this afternoon singing Psalter 290, um, stanzas 1 through 4 of 290. Praise ye the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks and bless his name. His loving kindness changes not from age to age the same. One through four. turn this afternoon to the book of Exodus. Our scripture reading will be from chapter 9 beginning in verse 13 and we'll be reading into chapter 10 to verse 20. We'll put together these two um, plagues. We saw last Lord's Day how what they have in common is that these are the two plagues that deal with the whole um, agricultural system of Egypt, they will together basically destroy all the last food resorts that Egypt has that's still green, that hasn't been dealt with by the other plagues, but it will by these two. And the Lord is dealing um, severely, and the heart of Pharaoh remains hard. These are two portions also that afford us um, a way to a little window into Pharaoh's heart. And after both events, there are things revealed that help us understand the condition of his heart. And so let us begin reading in chapter 9, verse 13 of Exodus. Hear God's own eternal and inspired word. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee, and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. 
As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go? Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that they may that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt and all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not fear the Lord. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold. But the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured forth upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder were ceased, he sinned yet more, and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. Am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast. And they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. And they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped, which remaineth unto you from the hail." And shall eat every tree which groweth for you out of the field. And they shall fill thy houses and the houses of all thy servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy father's fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he turned himself and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. And he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? And Moses said, 
We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones. Look to it, for evil is before you. Not so. Go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt, for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt, and eat every herb of the land, even all that hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they before them. There were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such, for they covered the face of the whole earth. So that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin, only this once, and entreat the Lord your God, that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go. Thus far in the reading of God's holy word. And let us respond to it by singing Psalter 290, stanzas 5 through 7. 290, 5 through 7, and standing, if you may. If we turn to page 13 in the back of our Psalters, we'll find the Article 19 of the Belgic Confession of Faith, <clears throat> which concerns the union and distinction of the two natures of the person of Christ with which we confess our faith this afternoon. Article 19, page 13, the union of the two natures and yet the distinction of the two natures, meaning the human and the divine. We believe that by this conception, 
The person of the Son is inseparably united and connected with the human nature so that there are not two sons of God, nor two persons, but two natures united in one single person. Yet that each nature retains its own distinct properties, as then the divine nature hath always remained uncreated without beginning of days or end of life, filling heaven and earth, so also hath the human nature not lost its properties, but remained a creature, having beginning of days, being a finite nature, and retaining all the properties of a real body. And though he hath by his resurrection given immortality to the same, to his body, nevertheless he hath not changed the reality of his human nature. For as much as our salvation and resurrection also depend on the reality of his body. But these two natures are so closely united in one person that they were not separated even by his death. Therefore that which he, when dying, commended into the hands of his father was a real human spirit departing from his body. But in the meantime, the divine nature always remained united with the human, even when he lay in the grave. And the Godhead did not cease to be in him any more than it did when he was an infant, though it did not so clearly manifest itself for a while. Wherefore we confess that he is very God and very man, very God by his power to conquer death, and very man that he might die for us according to the infirmity of his flesh. So well and clearly stated, the divinity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, two natures in one person. Let us then now join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious, almighty, our sovereign and eternal God, we worship Thee, Lord, the God who created all things, the God who is omnipotent, the God who is omnipresent, and who is omniscient. Thou, Lord, art holy in all thine attributes, and wise, and has all the knowledge that could be had. And Lord, thou art good and merciful. Thou art kind and gracious. And even, Lord, as we are before these plagues that Egypt endured, all through the hardness of the heart of a man who would not let thy people go. And yet we see, Lord, the, thy mercy in the same event, delivering a people who will not always be grateful and will not always be obedient. But it is a people thou art delivering in a merciful, gracious way. And we pray, Lord, that thou would help us realize how this whole um, history, which was true of the Israelites and Moses truly existed, yet it becomes also a figure, Lord, of our own salvation, that we too lived in bondage and we too were delivered only by thy mercy and grace. For we too are a people who are not perfectly obedient And we still do complain like the grumblings of thy people in the wilderness later. And we do not serve thee with a fullness of heart that we ought to serve thee. But yet, Lord, thou art the God who delivered us, who graciously brought us forth out of the darkness of death and of spiritual lostness and brought us to see in Christ our Savior and Lord so that we are in the path of the celestial city. We are pilgrims upon this world, marching toward the promised land. And so we thank thee, Lord, for these events that we can study in thy word. And, And we pray, Lord, that even though it is the history of thy people of old, we pray that thou would help us, Lord, and apply it to our hearts. Um, even as we see also Christ in the pages of Scripture. We see, Lord, all of these plagues falling upon Pharaoh. 
and for our sins to be forgiven. The plagues fell upon Christ. He, our Redeemer, our Savior, He's the one who received, Lord, plagues that hurt more grievously than all of these that we are studying. For he endured all of thy wrath because of our sins and suffered hell itself while nailed on the cross and even died and was buried. And Lord, we pray then, bring these passages that we have read to bear in our hearts and help us, Lord, to appreciate Christ. And we pray that Thou would be um, also convicting hearts, Lord, that may perhaps have refused to believe until this day. And we pray that even as we face Pharaoh, this man who is before so many great and powerful evidences of who thou art, and even of thy love and mercy and patience and kindness, and he will not let thy people go. Lord, we pray that there may be not a single soul within our hearing that would resist the power of the gospel, which is unto salvation of all who believe. And we plead with Thee at the same time, Lord, that Thou would open eyes to see and to believe and to trust, to grab hold of the Lord Jesus by faith, to repent of sins and transgressions. And Lord, we plead that Thou would forgive us of all our sins, that Thou would forgive us, Lord, of all complaining. Forgive us, Lord, for not valuing the salvation we have in Christ as we ought. Lord, we, we do not even understand the fullness of what the sufferings of the Lord Jesus meant and, and the power that was necessary for, for Him to die and to have life regained, for Him to be a sacrifice for our sins. And, and not be in hell forever as it would happen for any other human who dies in their sins. But for Christ to die and then to rise again, the power of the resurrection. We pray, Lord, that these passages where we see demonstrations of thy power, that it may serve as emblems and examples of the great power involved in the salvation of souls. And that we would then be so thankful and grateful that thou hast saved us. And we pray, Lord, that thou would add to the numbers of those who are saved. So that the thanksgivings may be multiplied unto thee, O Lord, our God and Savior. And Lord, we pray that thou would make these passages even more um, strikingly, dramatically real as we are in a moment in the existence, our existence, where basically every nation in the world is struggling with a disease to be controlled that has taken the toll, that has taken, Lord, a toll in the governments of this land. It has taken the lives of many. Lord, we acknowledge that there has been a plague upon the whole world. The, the world calls it a pandemic. Thy word calls it a plague it is thy heavy hand, and it is meant to break hearts. And oh, Lord, what we see and what we testify, do we not see, Lord, hearts that have been hardened, who refuse to go to thee for help or even to acknowledge thy hand when there is elements of deliverance. When the numbers go down, they attribute it to the means. When the numbers go up, they also attribute it to to people and even to thee. And they will say, where is God that he allows this to happen? But Lord, we pray that even as we undergo this pandemic, that there would be this result in our hearts to humble us, to make us see how we need our maker and that we would repent, that we would be obedient, that we would fear thee, unlike Pharaoh who would still not fear Thee, help us, Lord, to do so. And we pray that Thou would bless every family in our congregation, that Thou would protect, that Thou would provide. We pray, Lord, that Thou would um, heal those who may be ill, that Thou would strengthen, that Thou would carry us by the hand throughout this season. We long, Lord, and pray for the days that all things may be normal, that 
lives would not be suffering, that people, Lord, would not be suffering, that people um, would be living in ways in which um, are, are lighthearted and where we can, can acknowledge, Lord, that, that there's, there's an ease by which we may relate to one another and the tensions may be lessened. Lord, we, we, we just come to Thee asking that Thou would graciously allow such days to return. And Thou art all wise, and Thou knowest, Lord, the right time, the right moment. And we pray, Lord, until that day comes, help us to bow to the reality that, that it is of Thy hand. And we pray that it would have its purpose in each of our lives we pray, Lord, most of all, that it would work towards salvation of souls, that souls would be ready for eternity, that there would be an acknowledgement that life is brief, that we are not the lords of our lives. And we pray, Lord, work this way even in the lives of our president, in the lives of our vice president, of the governors of every state, of the mayors, all those in authority, we pray, Lord, that Thou would give them wisdom and guidance during these days. And we pray, Lord, again, most of all, that hearts would bend to King Jesus. And Lord, we pray that Thou would be with, with our elders and deacons. We thank Thee, Lord, for their lives and pray that Thou would help us as office bearers to shepherd this flock. Lord, what... What wonderful privilege it is, and we thank Thee, Lord, for every soul that has been entrusted to our care. We pray that Thou would keep them and protect them and help us as elders and deacons in shepherding, in counseling, in guiding. We pray, Lord, that Thou would go with us in so many of the events. We are two or three that we would not only remember, but that we would experience that then Thou art there in the midst of us that Thou would go, Lord, in every moment as, as we visit families, as we counsel individuals, as we call loved ones, and we pray, Lord, that Thou would be providing all that is necessary, all that is needed. And we pray, Lord, that if there are those who are suffering needs and wants, that it may come to our knowledge, that there may be um, even sharing, so that we may serve and help and bless those who are in need. And we continue to pray, Lord, for also Mr. Timko in Florida, Jennifer Henley's father. We do thank thee, Lord, for, for the good news of having a place for him to go, that they will care for him. We pray that thou would bless Jennifer in her caring for him and also a safe travel back to, to New Jersey soon. And we pray, Lord, be with all the Henleys in all their needs. And we, we ask, Lord, all these things, looking to the Lord Jesus Christ as our great, our great Savior, our great Shepherd, the one who guides and who counsels and provides and forgives and who blesses. And in His name we ask and look to Thee for help. In His name, Amen. And we'll be singing now Psalter 358 um, in all stanzas, standing if you may. We thank the Lord for your offerings and we pray that God would bless you and your offerings to Him. And we sing Psalter 358.
we open our Bibles again in Exodus chapter 9, beginning on verse 13 on, the passages we, we read contain these two events, these two plagues, plague number 7 and plague number 8. Um, the fish in the Nile were severely um, attacked, the frogs, lice, and flies made life upon earth basically unbearable. Then God sent disease upon the cattle. It befell the animals. Then He sent boils upon the men so that animals now and humans are suffering. And the plague of hail, which is plague number seven, with it God begins the attack upon agriculture, the food source upon the earth. With this hail, the flax and the barley will be smitten. And then the following plague, which we also read of, the locusts, plague number eight, with it, all of Egypt will be destroyed. That's what we read. It was the assessment of the servants of Pharaoh in chapter 10, verse 7. How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? They said that before the locusts even came. So if they thought Egypt destroyed before this plague, how much more destroyed it was after the locusts' visits. So God sent those first two plagues that concerned the river, the other two plagues that concerned the insects, and then two other plagues that concerned diseases, one upon animals and the second upon men. And now we are on the two plagues that concern all of agriculture. The first taking care of some of the crops that were already um, ready to be harvested or soon to be harvested. And even though the others were protected, well, the next plague would take care of those too. Remember, we looked at that. God, God puts these, these plagues in an outline form. God does everything to make it so clear that it is His finger. And we hope to consider now these, these two plagues. And even, even, even as we look at these two plagues, they, like I mentioned, they, they help us have a, a window into Pharaoh's heart. And so in our first point, we'll look at these two plagues. The second point, we'll look at Pharaoh's heart. And in our third point, we'll look at God's heart. And we'll see his good grace, even in the midst of all of this. Well, he certainly is showing his grace to his people they are, they are slaves there, and this is God delivering them. And even they don't deserve to be delivered, because remember, once they're gone, they're going to want to come back when things are hard in the wilderness. We, we know what's ahead, so it's God's mercy. And even we see elements of his common grace to Pharaoh. And it shows, again, very vividly here, this, we finally find Pharaoh speaking of sin, speaking of righteousness, pointing to God, speaking of wickedness, pointing to himself, and even speaking of forgiveness as something he needs. That's nothing short of common grace. Especially because we see in Pharaoh what happens to a man when God takes away even what's common of his grace. Because this is how we can understand his heart in the best way. So first of all, the hailstorm and the locusts. And what we have in both of these events, which follow um, a parallel with, with all of these um, the way the lice came, the way the flies came, the way the frogs came. It was all things that were, were maybe common in the sense that they had seen those before, but it was uncommon in the intensity and even in having one right after the other coming. So it, the, the hailstorm is told by God to be a hailstorm such as never had been seen in the history of Egypt. And some believe that what God was doing when he uses that phrase through Moses, that he's even using Egypt's own 
vocabulary or way of speaking, um, it was found that one of Egypt's pharaoh, Tutmos II, when he wanted to boast of his achievements, he would say it like this, that he was doing something more than all the things that were in the country since it was founded. And then when we read in chapter 9, verse 18, we hear what God is doing. He says, About this time I will cause to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. As if God is saying, your pharaohs have spoken that way. You understand this phraseology. Well, you will see something that you've never seen. And this hail will fall. And some of you, most of us have seen hailstorms. Maybe most of us have never seen a very dangerous hailstorm. But you know, as a little child, as I would see the hailstorm coming, it was always all exciting, and especially if it were in Brazil, because we never see snow there. But there is, from time to time, hailstorm, and that's the only time that you can see really the ground covered in white for a little moment before it all melts. But as a little child, as much as I was amazed by the beauty of what it looked, I never thought of what it would feel like if I was out there and, and had to run for a long time for shelter. That never really went through my mind as a little child, just caught in the wonder of it all. But God knew of this danger. And even, even in the warning in verse 19, he, he, he said, Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field. And okay, this is Moses speaking, but Moses spoke as a prophet. So, so he's not saying anything that God would not want him to say. God is warning. And in th this is where you see even elements of his mercy, even as he sends this plague. And he's giving them an opportunity to protect people and cattle. And he says, For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. Why, why, why will you die? It's as if God is saying this. I'm giving you a warning. Why? Why will you let your cattle die? You know you've seen what I've done. This is now plague number seven. And it's not just Pharaoh who had a hardened heart. Look at verse 20. And he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the house. So there are now those among Egypt who are beginning to get the idea and they're beginning to have a reverence. This word fear means this. It means a reverence, but it means to be afraid, to, to have this dread, and they're realizing if, if this is a warning from God, I'm not going to wait to see if this is true. This is the seventh time we've been warned. Six times it has happened. Let's bring the cattle in. Those were the God-fearers. But verse 21, And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. See, the, the, the Scriptures are bearing witness to the fact that these people were warned and they, of their own folly, refuse to regard what God has said. You see how Pharaoh's not the only one. And here it's interesting because we get a word that shows the opposite of fearing God. It is to not regard. It is to disregard. It is to disdain. And, and translated, it's the idea of snuffing. And, and you know how if something happens that you're offended and sometimes all you do is that sigh that you kind of send out a little puff through your nose? There's the concept of that. Of they, they just puff through their noses to God. That's the opposite of fear. Disrespect. Despising. And the hail came. Those that were outside died. Those who were inside were protected. It was God's grace. And then, and we'll, we'll talk about what happened. We, we see that, that Pharaoh um, called for help. This is where he, he, for the first time, says things that show a remorse. He says, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous. I and my people are wicked. We're, we're going to look at this in our second point. But just to go on to the... To the locust plague, as soon as, as the hailstorm ends, he sees that there's a respite. And he, in, in verse um, 34, it says how, how he saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder were ceased. And then he sinned once more. He hardened his heart and his servants, and they didn't let God's people go. So then God sent the locusts. 
And this time, the, the little emblem that's a little different here, and, and, it, and, it, and it even shows why we have to do this, why we preach through this passage. And fathers and mothers, as you read the Bible, um, elaborate a little bit on it because God's word is telling us in this plague of the locusts, this is now the eighth plague, and it's even telling us that we, we need to tell these stories to, to our children. Um, look at verse 2. And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's sons what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that ye may know how that I am the Lord. God is saying, one of the reasons I'm doing all this is so that you'll have stories to tell and stories that no one will ever forget. And beloved, there are many stories in this world that none of us know of. And you could read books and you'll find out, but we're not aware of them because they're not so famous. But everyone knows about the ten plagues in Egypt. Everyone knows that this leads to them going out into the wilderness and, and, and the opening of the Red Sea. Why did God make it so dramatic? Because he, he really made it with this design so that you and I would never forget these stories and that we would tell our children, and not just our children, but our grandchildren. So little children, you who are little children here, God is telling you as you grow up, you tell these stories to your children and to your grandchildren too. And this is what these stories are here for, so that we can think of the greatness of God and what He does. So locusts came um, in, and in, in little children, this might help you, some, some of your older children who may have read through Laura Ingalls Wilder books, maybe this is a familiar story to you. She tells one, she records of one such event that occurred in the prairies of Minnesota. And after describing the arrival of the huge brown grasshoppers that fell to the ground with with thuds all around her, hitting her head and her face and her arms, she, she looked and saw the clouds bringing grasshoppers, but realized the clouds were grasshoppers. They had thin, large wings gleaming and glittering. Um, she tried to, to beat them off, but they clung to her body and dress, so she ran screaming into the house and she then heard another sound that she described as one big sound made of tiny nips and snips and gnawings the grasshoppers were eating and you could hear the millions of jaws biting and chewing day after day the grasshoppers kept on eating they ate all that wheat and the oat They ate every green thing, all the garden, all the prairie grass. The whole prairie was bare and brown. And millions of brown grasshoppers whirred low over it. Not a green thing was in sight anymore. Until almost miraculous, she records, after a beautiful rain that began with a very small cloud that could hardly be seen but moved towards them and brought a rainfall that rained throughout the whole day and finally in a couple days they started seeing little green shoots that kept them from famine. To imagine boys and girls to be in that predicament. These things really happen. Locusts. In 1920s and 1930s locusts descended upon Africa and destroyed five million square miles. That's an area almost double the size of the United States. And in 1988, much closer to us, the Chicago Tribune described billions of locusts are moving across North America in the worst plague since 1954, blotting out the sun and settling on the land like a black ravenous carpet to strip it clean of vegetation. Of all these plagues that have been coming, it seems like these locusts have something very dramatic about it. The hail would fall and kill, but this this locust falls and starts eating and consuming. And it it tries to get into your home, and it said that they would get into the homes. And remember, imagine in, in the days of Egypt were even a lot harder than the days of Laura Ingalls Wilder, because there they could have shut and closed here and there and deal with 
lesser grasshoppers and made it in, but in Egypt, where they had a lot less ways of closing their open windows. And imagine the devastation. And why was God doing that? To show that he is God. To humble Pharaoh. And something very emphatic in the sending of locusts that will dwell a little more pretty soon in our second point, but is in, in verse 3 of chapter 10, when Moses and Aaron come to Pharaoh, he, he says, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? See, right there, we have a purpose. God is sending these plagues to humble Pharaoh. Why is he not yet humbled? And meanwhile, what God is doing is certainly humbling Pharaoh's gods, the gods of Egypt. And we've been seeing this as we work through some of these plagues. I mentioned some in a general way last time, but let me give you a list right now. Um, They had Anubis that was the guardian of the fields. And certainly this god Anubis had failed to guard those fields. Senehem, it, it was his fault because Senehem was the protector against pests very specifically. So it's obvious that the false god Senehem was not protecting at all. They also had the god Min, M-I-N. He was the patron of the crops, so they were to keep the crops, and they failed to do that. Isis was worshipped as the goddess of life, and there was an element of her using flax to prepare clothing, and there was now no flax, so there would be no clothing. And Nepri was the god of grain. And all the grain was gone. See, all of these false gods were defeated. God was showing that they don't even exist. And and the very reality that Egypt had this multiplicity of gods casts lights on why God brought a multiplicity of plagues. It was God going to the very venues of the, of the religion, of the hearts of the people, and showing these gods don't exist. Stop fearing them and fear me. And, and it was happening. There were some who were showing this kind of veneration to God. And again, we, we don't know to what degree it was saving, but it was probably having a saving effect in the lives of some. We don't know. But we see... These two plagues. Now, this leads us to our second point Pharaoh's hard heart. Now, I want to deal today with, with this confession of fear. What do we, what do, we do with this? In, in chapter 9, verse 27, he says, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, I, and my people are wicked. These, these are amazing words. And he says, entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. Now, if you're like me, you read these words and you think, how could they come from his lips? And at the same time, you feel suspicious of things like saying, I have sinned this time. What about last time? Or when he adds, for it is enough. Who are you to say it is enough? You see, these are the, the, the cracks and the faults. But we will, we will look into it a little longer. But connect this also with what he says. And when he pleads to Moses for the locusts to go away, that's chapter 10, verse 17. He says, now therefore forgive. He uses that word, another wonderful word. I pray thee, my sin, only this once. And there you think, why does he say that? And entreat the Lord your God that ye may take away from me this death only. Well, let's look at this. The reason it's, it's a little confusing is because there are some good things that, that clearly are good. Um, the words, the phrases, and even the timing, we can say good things about it. If you think of the words, it is good to say that you have sinned when you have. It is good to say the Lord is righteous, and it's good to say you aren't, and that you're wicked. Those are all good things and, and good phrases. And, and the timing was good, too, because even though it was after so many judgments, and here's the warning of another, it's always better to repent earlier than later. We we could say only negative things, thinking only now, after the seventh plague that's warned, you will say you have sinned. 
But, but let's try to be very positive and think, well, he is saying it now. So it is a good timing. God has brought these judgments. He's having some element of, of reckoning. He believed in prayer because he's asking Moses to pray. He, he believed even in the efficacy of prayer. And that brings the thought. I'm saying he believed. There's faith in Pharaoh. He put all those things, as it were, on a shelf. And let's look at the bad. Well, what is bad? Well, it's the lack of words, the lack of phrases, and even the timing. See, we can say these things. See, he could have said much more, for his sins were much greater. And, and, and a true repentant heart who has been suffering all of these judgments should never say, I have sinned this time. What about all the other times? Is he asking forgiveness for having in, put into bondage God's people? Is he asking forgiveness for throwing in the Nile River all the baby boys? Is he asking for forgiveness for having worshipped the myriad gods himself and even portraying himself as, as a false god to the people because the pharaohs were seen as false god. Is he, is he acknowledging all of these sins, that he despised God, that he, that he blasphemed against God? You see, there, there were a myriads of sins, and he's saying, forgive me. He says, forgive this sin. I have sinned this time. In verse 27, it's, it's, it's the lack of words. He should have said, I have sinned many gross sins, Moses. Like the psalmist, they're more than the hairs of my head. From my mother's womb, I was conceived in sin. I have sins of shedding innocent blood that mar my heart. I have sins of blasphemy. I have sins of idolatry. I have sins of covetousness, of pride, of complaining, of lack of fearing God and disdaining. I have sinned many, many countless sins. You see how many words are lacking. And then the timing, even though it is better earlier than later. See, it is after judgment and it is good. But see, it is the sixth judgment that he then finally says, forgive me this time. And, and there's a danger here when, when you're only really broken because you've been discovered in your sin and because now the consequences are very great. That kind of repentance is always somewhat suspicious. It could be true, but it could be that the only sadness you have is the consequence that you're suffering and not truly the grievousness that you caused your God. Pharaoh has no grief for having rebelled against God. He only has grief because Egypt is suffering. He has grief because he's being dishonored. And what proves this to be a false confession is that there's no fruit that follows. You know, the very first one follows where there's the need of a locust. And as soon as the locusts come and he pleads and he even says, please, uh, he says, therefore forgive. And it all sounds very, very beautiful. But you know, verse 21, that's when the darkness comes. And then there's still the 10th plague of the death of the, of the firstborn. So two more plagues are needed after he says, forgive. Because no fruit followed. But I want to point to one thing, and perhaps this is the most telling that his confession was false, that his faith was not true faith. And this is where I'll even talk about bring back from that um, um, shelf where you put the good things, where it seems like he believes. He believes in prayer. He believes there's a God to pray to. He believes that prayer is efficient. Because he's saying, Moses, pray for me. So he's believing it will happen if you pray. It's amazing to think of the amount of faith that he had. When you think of faith merely as believing and not entrusting. He's never entrusting his life to this God, to Jehovah. But he is believing. He has power. He believes he exists. He believes Moses is his intercessor. He believes that if Moses prayers... Praise, it will avail much. 
But what do you do with that faith? And it always helps me when I find another sermon, another pastor who explains this much better than myself. And, and I found Spurgeon saying this when he explains this faith of Pharaoh. He says, in certain instances, the man's hope in prayer is the result of a condemning faith. He calls it a condemning faith, and you'll understand as he continues. There is a justifying faith and a condemning faith. What, say you, does faith ever condemn man? Yes, when men have faith enough to know that there is a God who sends judgments upon them, that nothing can remove those judgments, but the hand that sent them, and that prayer moves that hand. See, these are all the things he knows. There are persons who yet never pray themselves, but eagerly cry to friends, entreat the Lord for me. There is a measure of faith which goes to increase a man's condemnation, since he ought to know that if what he believes is true, then the proper thing is to pray himself. See, the very fact that Pharaoh said, go to your God and pray to him, what is that? That is unbelief. Because he's not trusting that God. He's, he's still afraid of that God. And, and of course you can understand, rightly so, because he has reason to be fearful of that God. But he's not showing any desire for reconciliation with that God and serving that God and loving that God. He's saying, Moses, you deal with him. He'll listen to you. I don't dare talk to him. That's why... Spurgeon calls it a condemning faith because he knows enough. Why doesn't he talk to him? Because it would be too humbling to do so. He would have to bow his head. He would have to come to his knees. And he would have to lift his eyes and say, Lord, I have sinned against thee. And he will not do that. He believes there's a God. But he doesn't believe that that God is worthy to be served. That's why Pharaoh had a false confession. But I want to look deeper into the heart of Pharaoh. Because there's still the reality of his hardening his heart... And the verses, it says that the Lord hardened his heart. And I, and I, I know I mentioned this even in, in the beginning, a few years ago when we went through Exodus and we saw already chapters um, 4 and then also 7 speak of the Lord hardening his heart. And I spoke a little bit about hardening the heart and th this whole theology. But I think there's more to it that I didn't cover that time. And I, and I want to try to do it this time. And I want to start... We saw this last time already. I won't go through all the verses, but when you read the whole portion, you do find this sequence. Basically, every single plague ends with his hardening his own heart or later the Lord hardening his heart and then him not letting the people go. There's, there's a formula. Um, the formula goes like this. Like one example is chapter 8, 19. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He hearkened not unto them and the as the Lord had said, or, or that he wouldn't let the people go. There's this hardening, a desire not to listen to what Moses said, which would have been what God said, and then deciding, I will not let the people go. And there's a sequence where the first instance is, is, is Pharaoh's heart was hardened, or Pharaoh hardened his heart, and later, towards the end, we find the Lord hardening his heart, the Lord hardening his heart. And to be very fair, the very beginning of it all, God said, I will harden his heart. Well, let's look at the word hardened, first of all. 
in and of itself, it's, it's a neutral word. It can be used in positive ways and in negative ways because it means to strengthen. It means to prevail, to become strong and, and resolute, to even have a courageous and bold heart. It is to have a display of strength, to put forth strength. So you can imagine, of course, in a good situation, it would be to, you know, to have a, a heart that is brave and courageous where you put yourself in danger, like in a battle to deliver someone, deliver even a nation. Um, you, 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 you put yourself in a situation to help a loved one. That is someone with, with a brave heart, we would say. We wouldn't say a hardened heart in that case. But against God, when you have a heart that is hard against God, your creator, your maker, the one who gives you everything, the one who, who, who gives you strength, that you would make yourself strong against him, the one who gives you um, diligence, that you would then use that diligence to prevail against him. See, that is utter madness. And this is what Pharaoh did. And it was what unbelievers do all the time. And, and think of this in the gospel. As the gospel comes forth, it is a message that comes with a proposition to you. But it's more than a proposition because it's a command. And it is an offer. And it is an invitation. And it is a summons. And it has power. It has strength. And it gives you power. And it makes you strong. When you believe, what is faith? Faith is yielding to that truth. It is submitting to the summons. It is obeying the very commands that came to you. It is to accept the invitation. But what is unbelief? Unbelief is a sinner using his strength to resist the power of the gospel. It is the unbeliever resisting the message. It is prevailing against the command. It is despising the invitation. And this is what's astonishing. You know how we often say that when you believe in God, that, that is not works. Because you're not saved by works, and yet by faith you are saved. And we often reiterate to make it very clear, when you do believe and when you repent, you're having no work whatsoever. Now, you know how you have work? It's to not believe. Think of how much Pharaoh is working hard. He's resisting heaven. Talk about hard work. Unbelievers offer human resistance against a message of divine power. It is man fighting against God. That is work. And it is works condemnation. To be saved, it is the work of Christ going to the cross and giving you a heart to believe. And all you're doing in faith is bowing. You are surrendering. Remember always the key word surrender. Surrender is no work whatsoever. You're literally saying, I have no work I could possibly do. And I believe that what Christ has done is what I need for me. But the unbeliever makes himself strong against the one who gives him strength. And that, beloved, is the greatest folly of sin. We are using the strength that God gave us to sin against the strength giver. That's what the word hardened brings. And, there, and yet there's another word hardened because most of the word hardened as in 7.22 is that idea of, of, a, of a heart that is resolute that is strong, but there are a few other places that is translated hardened, but it's really the word heavy and weighty, which in the positive sense, it can also be used in a positive sense, that could even give the idea of being honored and, and of being glorious, of being made abundant, but when a heart is heavy against God, then it conveys the thought of being insensitive, of being dull. It's like you speaking to a stone and you just see that stone looking at you and you come with the thought, you know, this stone is not listening to me. It is dull. It is insensitive. See, it's not so much the hardness of the stone, but just the fact that it doesn't respond. 
It just sits there looking at you because it has no life. And that's how Pharaoh's heart was. It was completely insensitive to God. He thought he could prevail. And he worked hard to do so. His heart stood as a solid rock. He had courage. He had power. He had strength against God. So the first instances, we hear him doing that. Pharaoh hardened his heart. But then we see the last instances and even the first ones. And God says, I will harden his heart. And, and without doubt, we are here in the realm of God's sovereignty. Connected with the reality of human responsibility. And it's what we always say. Those are not opposites. They are not contrary. They are truths that are solid. God has given us responsibility and he is 100% sovereign. They are not f enemies, Spurgeon would say, that we need to reconcile. They are friends. They walk together. One other way Spurgeon demonstrated it, he said it's like the train tracks that are right side by side. And as you look at the train tracks, they're separate. But as you look at the horizon, you know, boys and girls, if you ever stood, only do this with your parents there. I always feel so scared to be on top of a train track. So don't ever do this without maybe Tom Rose right with you. <laughs> but if you see the train tracks in the safest of situations and no train is, is at all there and you look at the horizon and where do those lines go? They meet. And that's how Spurgeon put it, that here sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man here on earth, we just don't see how they come together. But there in heaven, in, in eternity, they're, they're united. So always remember, if you try the train thing, talk to your parents or to Mr. Tom Rose. I want to be very careful. <laughs> there are many train tracks around here. I'm always kind of leery, even with a car going over them, because you never know if you did hear the train or not. But always remember the sovereignty of God and responsibility of men, little children, when you see a train track. How can we put them together? One, one, one way of explaining is like this, and it's not wrong, but it's not the whole truth concerning Pharaoh. That God was seeing that Pharaoh was hardening his heart, he was hardening his heart, he was refusing, he was refusing. So God finally acted in judgment, and he himself said, fine, Pharaoh, so your heart will remain that way. And I won't help it be unhardened, and I will... Harden your heart. The reason this is not the full thing is because of certain things we hear God saying. But why is this part of the truth? Well, this is what we read elsewhere. And if you go to Romans 1 and you, you know you get to that um, explanation where God is saying that his wrath is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. And then you see that there's this lineup of sins, of idolatry. And then you see verse 24 of chapter 1 of Romans, that God gave them up to uncleanness. And then all that sin of immorality is already in the realm of judgment. That If they're living in that, it's because God left them into it. And then, as they stay there and don't repent, God repeats in verse 26, God gave them up unto vile affections. So it's like they go deeper into the realm of sexual sin. And then if they don't repent and they remain in that, then you go to verse 28 and you read, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So you could say, well, then God was hardening their hearts. But you see what God is doing. God is in no event. He is forcing them to remain in sin. He's simply handing them over to the sin that they desire and that they glorify. And you just see this chain reaction of, of, of a life of sin lending to judgment, a, more judgment, and then more judgment. And it is what's happening to Pharaoh. But we see something deeper in the case of Pharaoh. And it's very similar to what happened to Judas. And you could say it's very likely what happened to Pilate and to Herod 
and to Annas and to Caiaphas. There, there are certain characters in God's word that this applies to. That they were born, as it were, for this very purpose. And that's the key word, purpose. See, if we say only that God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his heart, then it would mean that God was merely responding to Pharaoh. But what we read, especially if you go to chapter 7, verse 3, look at what we find God saying in chapter 7, verse 3. It says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. See, there's a purpose. God is not just responding to Pharaoh as if God were on the sidelines. God is saying, I will use Pharaoh. Yes, it is a scary thought. Especially if you were to think, could God be using this loved one of mine who never, ever repents? Could that be the reality for me who has not yet come to Christ? But notice this one thing, beloved, and this is where I want to get to. God never forced Pharaoh to sin. When it says he hardened his heart, it never means that God went into that heart and, and whispered, as it were, or forced him to, to not let God's people go or to say, resist me. God, God tempts no one. That's a theological truth. It would be blasphemous for us to think that that's what this passage means. So what does this mean? It means simply this. What God is doing is simply leaving Pharaoh to Pharaoh's own heart. God is removing every protection Every help, every means of grace, every angel's ministry, every, every Christian's influence, every, every salt's seasoning, every bit of light that would enlighten Pharaoh's heart. If, if he were to completely remove the Holy Spirit's influence and counsel and prodding in his heart, if he allows the conscience of Pharaoh to be completely seared and not hear a, not the tiniest bit of reason, and if he allows the temptations to prevail, and if he allows Satan and his devils to sail freely, you have Pharaoh. And there are other men in history that you could say, you have him. And beloved, what this does is show to you and me not the anatomy of the heart of Pharaoh, but the anatomy, anatomy of the human heart. Period. The human heart, your heart and my heart. If you had never heard anything about God, if you had never heard anything about the Ten Commandments, if you had never understood anything about good and evil from a biblical perspective, and if God had not allowed any bit of His grace to come near to your life, to affect you in any way, no missionary, no evangelist, no gospel, no church, no praising, no choir, no music, no prayer, and you have no concept of anything whatsoever divine and Godward, this is your heart. This is my heart. This is what God's doing. Pharaoh becomes a mirror of who we are if God were to take his hand completely away. And what's astonishing, beloved, is that he still puts a little something of his hand. We have to conclude it. Because how can this wicked man with such hard heart so many times over being emphasized use these words like I have sinned and and to say um, um uh, Lord is righteous and, and we are wicked and words that maybe some Christians haven't used yet has every Christian said I am wicked maybe not but Pharaoh did how could he say, forgive, I pray thee, my sin? And many people who aren't very much living an immoral life, they haven't used the word forgive me. But this wicked man has. My only answer to this is God's grace. 
It's like Spurgeon said, he had a faith. He started believing this God exists. He started believing this God answers prayer. He started believing all that Moses says is true. He started believing that, yes, if he has some reconciliation with this God, it'll be better with me. If, if sin is the problem, I'll confess that. I'll use the word forgiveness. I'll say I'm wicked and I'm say that thou art righteous. And what is that? It is God's grace. But you see, it is God showing if I give grace enough, you can say those things. But you need more. You need my saving grace. And then what will happen is not that you'll just say the right things. You'll, you'll have the right heart. And you will really look to God and, and, and not just use excuses or, or, or even say that some sins are this and that. No, you'll, you'll just really come and say, Lord, there is nothing for me to do. I have been working and laboring this far. Yes, it was, it was a works condemnation that I was living. But now I want to surrender. There's no work that I can possibly do. No merit that I dis, 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 deserve. Lord, thou art righteous and I am wicked. Forgive me, save me. Now, our third point, God's good grace. See, that is God's good grace. He was being gracious even to Pharaoh. Beloved, look where you see this grace. Because some people could very stoically say, no, Pharaoh is an instrument that God had for his purpose of his sovereignty. Yes, all of that is true. And yes, there's an element where we see God giving some warnings for Pharaoh. Look what he says to Pharaoh in chapter 10, verse 3. When the locusts are about to come, he, sa he says, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go. Go. What God is saying is, Pharaoh, I am humbling you. How long will it take for you to be humbled? That is grace. And Pharaoh knew what humbling meant because the word for humbling is the word of, of coming low and even has a concept of being oppressed. And, and, and Pharaoh knew very well how to do that. He had oppressed many people, and he made many people bite the dust, you would say. But he didn't know how to do it. He didn't know how to fall before this almighty God and literally like have his face on the dust before God. And God is saying, how long will it take for you to do what you know how to do very well? You, you, you knew how to humble the Israelites and deliver them from all their baby boys. Oh, you oppressed them so greatly. They were on the dust. But how long will you do it before you do it? In 1 Peter 5, 5, it says, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And you see, God is humbling Pharaoh. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And I, I want to go back to Spurgeon one more last time because he also gives a wonderful idea here that is so, so much how you apply all of this. Because at this point, we need to, in a sense, we've done it already. We need to forget Pharaoh. We need to think of our own hearts. In a, in a way I've already said, Pharaoh is revealing your heart and mind. Well, look what Spurgeon says. He says, forget Pharaoh and only think of yourself. Let the Lord Jesus Christ himself with the thorn crowned head and the pierced hand stand by your pew and looking right down into your soul, say in his matchless tune of music, the music of the heart of love, how long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Beloved, if there be one or could there be more souls here who have not yet humbled yourself to this God, the same God who brought those plagues is the God of the universe today. If you haven't humbled yourself, how long? And it's his grace to you. This sermon is his grace to you. And I want to end with this where we see God's grace Remember always this, all of these plagues, all of these plagues, God is showing his power. He's showing his judgment upon Egypt. He's showing his mercy upon his people. 
And, and then the people go and they're in the, in, the, in, the, in the direction of the promised land. Remember, and we look at this and we see, well, this is an emblem of the gospel. God delivers us from Egypt. We go into our pilgrimage towards heaven. And the last thing is crossing the Jordan River. And that is a symbol of death. And then, then we're in heaven. Well, if we look at this figure, if, if this paradigm, what are all these plagues? This is, this is the power of God that comes before they are delivered out of Egypt. And it's showing us how for you, if you're a true believer, do you appreciate this? Do you acknowledge the, the absolute and sheer power that was necessary to turn you from one who was in darkness and now bring you to be in light? One who was in the kingdom of Satan and now in the kingdom of the Son of God's love. And it was power. But what was all that power? God showing all those plagues was his power, but they were plagues. What was the power? The power was Christ dying on the cross. And he's the one who received the plagues of God upon him. There are even emblems of all these plagues that the Lord Jesus suffered on the cross, the Nile River and all that blood, and on the cross and all the blood that he shed to the very last plague where the firstborn were all killed, but not the firstborn of Israel because of the blood of the Lamb. And on the cross, it was the blood of the Lamb. For you to be saved, dear, beloved Christian. It took Christ, who as we read from the confession, who is God and who is man, to die. And on the cross, I believe this is how we should see it. All of these plagues, the locusts and the hail and every, every other plague, when we see all of the sadness and the curse connected to them, that's to show us a little something of what Christ felt upon the cross. It was like he was receiving all these plagues upon him, all the blood of the Nile River just flowing out of his body, and the frogs and the lice and the locusts and the hail, just feeling God's wrath as it were a hailstorm of, of rain and ice and fire upon his soul and the darkness we're going to see next time Lord willing the three days of darkness and the Lord Jesus had there as it were an eternity of darkness from the time of noon to the time of three o'clock three hours and in the plagues it was three days and that was a plague upon him the darkness where he couldn't see the countenance of the favor of his father and then there's the plague of the firstborn dying and when the darkness goes away, God's firstborn dies. He gives up the ghost. You see, boys and girls, these plagues are not just upon Egypt. They were upon Jesus. And as when you look at Laura Ingalls Wilder and just thinking those locusts all over and running to the house, that's to make us feel what those Egyptians were feeling. Jesus felt the pain of these plagues upon him on the cross so that you and I could have our sins pardoned and forgiven so that you'll never, ever know a spiritual plague of hell. Can you imagine, beloved, eternal darkness? Fire unquenchable. It's like an eternal plague. Demons are described as frogs and the inconvenience of lice and flies. Beelzebub is called the Lord of the flies. And it's like souls are denigrated in hell as if they were flies and no better than worms. Beloved, who? Who can, who can take that? Well, that's why you don't. It's called a second death. And boys and girls, young people, if this brings fear and dread to your heart, I, I, I thank the Lord because it is an answer to prayer because it is what these plagues are meant to do. It is meant to make us see, do what Pharaoh wasn't doing, that we would fear God, that we would reverence Him, that, and that we would stop all the work of fighting against Him with that stoic heart and dull heart that is insensitive to who God is and that we would just come 
acknowledging the summons, putting down the weapons of war and saying, Lord, save me, even me. And rejoicing that there's, there's nothing for you to do but to accept and to believe that he desires to save you and that his son's death on the cross is sufficient for you. May these plagues turn us, our hearts to Christ to both appreciate our salvation and also to be saved, those who aren't. All by the grace of God we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious, glorious God Almighty, we plead with Thee, Lord, who sent these plagues one by one at the command of Moses in obedience to Thy Word for the, for the humbling of Pharaoh's heart to demonstrate Thy power, Thy justice, and Thy mercy. And we would plead, Lord, that it would work in our hearts by way of mercy, that Thou would save every soul among us, Lord, young and old, man and woman, our elderly, our little children, our fathers and mothers, that each and every one of us would see, Lord, that salvation is by Thy grace alone, and that we would even see that the faith that we would have and the repentance we would have, it is a gift of thine, not a work of ours. The real work is to resist, to have a heavy heart against thee. Lord, we pray, bring with dread the thought that if there have been heavy, hardened hearts, that there's always a danger of them remaining harder and harder still. And it reveals, Lord, how we need thy grace so desperately. Not a single one of us would ever turn to thee had thou not turned us to thee and, and given us life so that our eyes could truly see Christ. Lord, may this be a day where we give all the glory and honor to thee for our salvation and that thou would be glorified in the salvation of others. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we sing together Psalter 36, stanzas 3 through 5, and our doxology is 405, 6 through 7.
now the blessing of the Lord and go to your homes in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.